Well, uh, this last week, I know we had uh, really great warm weather, except for today. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we had uh, like 17 kids' activities planned for today, soccer and cross-country and things like that. Uh, most of them got canceled, which is it's okay. Um, but I, this last week, I went to uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina. I uh, kind of have to go see family, have to go relax and be on the beach. Um, don't, be, don't be too jealous because actually it was warmer here than there. Um, in fact, if you want to like, um, you know, just it's cold out, kind of snuggle in and fall asleep watching golf this afternoon, the Heritage Golf Classic, that's, that's where I was. Not, I wasn't watching golf, but I was just at the beach and hanging out with my, my, my granddad and grandma. Uh, my granddad turned 93 recently and uh, found out that uh, I'm a kind of like a, a celebrity. Uh, my grandma's sister, Georgia, who's in her 80s, in, in Connecticut, watches me, watches us. So hi, Georgia, if you're watching. Um, but great time to get away, be with family, and just to relax. Um, you know, we had Easter just before that. And kind of a long uh, week of, of ministry and doing things. And if you were here around for the last kind of month, month and a half, we, we did this whole sermon series uh, leading up to Easter. Uh, we called it this journey to Calvary. We looked at kind of the, the last week of Jesus' life, kind of um, expanded over a month and a half of things he did, uh, emotions, all kinds of things that, that happened. Well, we're going to um, kind of follow that chronological uh, story of Jesus uh, and kind of speed up now because after Jesus uh, is resurrected, uh, he spends 40 days with his disciples. He's teaching. Uh, he's, he's kind of warning them of some things, telling them, uh, doing some miracles. And then on the, the 40th day, he, he, he goes up into heaven. Uh, this is from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. That's how it describes it. Uh, he says to his disciples who are there, uh, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. For ten days... Nothing happens. For 10 days, uh, Jesus is no longer with them. He had died, resurrected. He had taught them. And, and, then, and then for 10 days, he's just not there. On the 10th day, we'll, we'll read this story a little later on this morning. But on the 10th day, it's called Pentecost. As Jesus said, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. There's this loud rushing wind. There's fire and languages and all kinds of things. And all, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where we're going to go this next kind of month or, or four weeks is to focus in on the Holy Spirit. This kind of who, what, where, when, why Holy Spirit. And, and I've titled this, this sermon this morning, Forgotten God. And it comes straight from, from a book title. I stole it. It's uh, a book title by Francis Chan. Uh, there's two books I want to recommend to you, and this is one of them that's a really easy, uh, good uh, read. But he says this from his book, uh, Forgotten God. He says, from my perspective, the Holy Spirit is tragically neglected and for all practical purposes forgotten. While no evangelical would deny his existence, I'm willing to bet there are millions of churchgoers across America who cannot confidently say they have experienced his presence or action in their lives over the past year. And many of them do not even believe they can. He goes on to talk about, he feels there's just something missing in our churches today. And he says, I believe that this missing something is actually a missing someone, namely the Holy Spirit. Without him, people operate in their own strength and only accomplish human-sized results. 
The world is not moved by love or actions that are of human creation. The church is not empowered to live differently from any other gathering of people without the Holy Spirit. But when believers live in the power of the Spirit, the evidence in their lives is supernatural. The church cannot help but be different, and the world cannot help but notice. Somebody one time uh, tried to kind of throw a jab at um, evangelicalism, kind of our, our, our church or denomination that we're a part of, and they said, you're kind of, you have this like, Jesiology thing you do. It kind of meant to these play on words about you, you talk about Jesus too much and this kind of Jeezy, cheesy, you know, theology. It's always about Jesus. That's all you do. We got a cross in here. We just came out of Easter talking about Jesus. And on the one hand, I'm like, I'm okay with that. We talk about Jesus. We're all about Jesus. Yeah, that's fine. Their, their jab, though, is like, what about? God the Father? What about the Holy Spirit? And I think, yeah, maybe there is some neglect or fear that we have sometimes of the Holy Spirit, or what do we do with the Trinity? I don't understand it. What do I do with it? That's one reason why I want to talk about this topic and look at scriptures to understand more about this. But Even more, one of our values as a church, we we state this out in our values, is that we we desire to be open. We want an openness to the Spirit in our worship, in our praying, in uh, baptisms and new believers, reading Scripture. We're open. We want the Holy Spirit to come here and work. I I grew up uh, in church. I grew up in a Lutheran church, and I don't even know if we ever once mentioned the Holy Spirit. Maybe we read about it in the Bible, but it was, it was never even talked about at all. My, my wife, on the other hand, she grew up uh, in an Assembly of God church where they talk about charismatic gifts and things like that. And so when I came to college and we met for the first time, it was kind of this this uh, new idea, mixing of worlds for me to think about things the Bible talks about. I mean, healing, gifts, uh, speaking in tongues, and then to go to the Bible and figure out what, what is this? What, what is the Bible talking about? We value it. We desire it. And I believe that if we ever want to grow, I mean, not just kind of numerically, but spiritually and in, in, in depth that we, we need this. We need to be a people of prayer that desire the working of the Holy Spirit. And, and one thing, too, that happened this last, uh, n- not even six months ago, but in February, uh, maybe you saw this on the Internet, or I think I talked about it once in church, there was an um, a, a event that happened in Kentucky. It was called, the, at the time, the Asbury Revival. And I always think about revivals in, like, the 1600s or 1700s, and these preachers that would preach for hours and people would come and from far, far away to come. But this was, in our day, it was a group of college students that began to stay after a, a college worship service. And for, uh, for, from February 8th to 24th, they stayed uh, all day, all night praying, worshiping. And people from all over began to flock to Asbury College uh, Pastor Prabin, who uh, he's the pastor of Hebron, our, our Nepalese church that meets here. Him and a group, they drove out there to just check it out and be a part of it. But I, I desire revival here. I desire the Holy Spirit to work in some dramatic and amazing way. But there's also dangers, it seems like, that there, that there should be cautions to, to abuses that have happened with the Holy Spirit or charismatic gifts or things like that. Scripture tells us that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4. Or as as David is praying in Psalm 51, he's he's saying, cast me not away from your presence, take not your spirit from me. Or in Acts chapter 7, as Stephen is preaching to the Jews, 
he tells them, you always resist the Holy Spirit. These are things that I don't want to happen to, to me or to us, that we would grieve or resist or have the Holy Spirit taken away from us. So this morning, we're going to kind of do this who, what, where, when, why type thing. I don't know if this illustration will make sense to you. It, it makes sense to me, but I, I like, I like um, movies. I like uh, Marvel movies over DC movies, superhero movies, and there was this Avengers superhero movie that came out where there were two groups meeting. One group was looking for their friend whose name was Gamora, strange name, and they say to the second group, you know, where, where is Gamora? And the second group has no idea you know, this name. And, and the other group says, you know, I'll do you one better. You know, what is Gamora? And somebody, an actor, kind of ad-libs in the scene and they kept it in there. It says, I'll do you one better. Why is Gamora? It's kind of this like ridiculous, like who, what, where, when, why. But I feel the same way about the Holy Spirit sometimes. Like, I could ask any question about the Holy Spirit, like, who is the Holy Spirit? Why do we want Him? How does He work? Where, where is the Holy Spirit? And so that's what we're going to start with today. Just these simple questions. So first off, why? Why should we study, know, uh, even desire the Holy Spirit in our own life? We have Jesus. Isn't that enough? <laughs> Well, Jesus himself told his disciples, tells us that it is to our advantage in some way to have the Holy Spirit. So turn with me to John chapter 16. We're going to be jumping a little bit in Scripture, and so you can follow along with the screens in your paper Bible or phone. But John 16 is the middle of a big teaching where Jesus is teaching about um, the Holy Spirit teaching about abiding in Him, um, the, the vine and branches metaphor. And He says this about uh, him, him going away. Jesus is going away, and He wants to encourage them. He says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, it becomes much clearer as you read more in there. We'll read more later. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. It's, it's to our advantage. It's better, maybe, that, that Jesus goes to the cross, resurrected, goes to heaven, goes away, and have the Holy Spirit. I mean, if it were me... I just kind of feel like I would much rather have Jesus here, right? I mean, sitting in front of me to talk to, or like if he was here, I would just sit down and he would preach for you, right? I mean, feels like, why is that better, more advantageous? Well, this is what Jesus is saying, that there's something about the Holy Spirit when he comes, when he works, that is better. In fact, in this time now, this is the primary uh, manifestation of, of God with us, right? We don't have Jesus walking with us right now, but we have the Holy Spirit. And as we'll see in this series, the Holy Spirit is, um, is, is powerful and, and does things through us, in us. I'll explain more of these as I go on, but he gives uh, gifts to us. He, he kind of produces fruit in us of love and joy and peace. He gives guidance. He's just simply called here the, the helper. He helps. He, he helps understand the Bible. He encourages us, gives us peace, fills us, helps us to pray. I mean, if this is somebody who lives in us and does all these things, then yeah, we should get to know this person, get to know God who lives in us. And second, I think why we, we should study this and, and know and, and desire the Holy Spirit is we're, we're warned in Scripture um, that we can quench or stop the Holy Spirit in some ways. And we don't want to do that. If it's our, to our advantage or better to have Him, that we can hinder in some ways 
the Holy Spirit. I read earlier, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, we can resist the Holy Spirit, and we don't want to be a church, I don't want to be a pastor, we don't want to be a people that, that does that, that quenches the Holy Spirit. It's this, this idea that you have a fire, and to quench a fire, to pour water on it, or dirt, or whatever, to put it out, to squelch it, to get rid of it. Uh, our church would be nothing without the working of the Holy Spirit. We don't want that to happen. I, I know that I've used this story and analogy before, but it, it makes so much sense for this idea of quenching the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, we would go up to Hidden Acres uh, to do a camp for our students, and we would always do a campfire every evening. And one evening, there was a, a bucket by the, the, the fire, and I thought it was just some, some dirt, whatever, to squelch this fire out. And so I poured this on the fire. Turned out it was fire starter. And so the exact opposite happened to what I wanted. It just flamed up bigger. In some sense, this is what we want to have happen even in our church, in our own lives. That we don't want to just squelch and destroy and deter the Holy Spirit, but to um, encourage, to flame up greater encouragement and lead us on. Now, it helps to know a little bit of kind of maybe a who question, too, of well, who is the Holy Spirit? And what I want to do now is actually I want to um, read together something. So we, we are part of the Evangelical Free Church of America. It's our denomination. And we uh, have these 10 statements about what we believe. And two of them talk directly about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read one now and one a little bit later. And if you feel comfortable, I encourage you to read this out loud with me. This is something we've done in, in, in church before. Other churches do it, kind of read out loud together, affirm what we believe. So uh, read this with me here. We believe in one God, creator of all things, holy, infinitely perfect, eternally existing in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, having limitless knowledge and sovereign power, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself and to make all things new for his own glory. There's a lot. There's a lot packed in there, right? Uh, a lot of amazing good things about God's glory and his plan and purpose. But I want to underline this right here. It talks about the Holy Spirit. He's God existing in a loving unity of three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the first thing I wanted to talk about in terms of who the Holy Spirit is, is that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. Maybe you've, you've heard that term before, you've done some study, seen it, kind of, okay, there's, there's a Father, there's a Son, there's a Holy Spirit, but what does that mean? In our statement of faith there, it talks about these um, three equal persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but one God. And this is what we believe. It may be hard or confusing, but this is what Scripture teaches us, that there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three persons, one uh, essence, subsistence, one God. I want to show you three passages kind of quickly that just kind of put Father, Son, Holy Spirit all on the same level, all together. When Jesus is getting baptized in Matthew chapter 3, says, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You have Jesus being baptized, Holy Spirit coming down, Father speaking. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all working there, all present. 
Then when Jesus is uh, at the end of his, his ministry, he gives this great commission, Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, equal, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Don't just baptize the name of Jesus or Father or Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then one more, as, as Paul is giving this one last blessing, it's not just Jesus who mentions these things, but Paul says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, that's the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So I brought my whiteboard up here. I don't do this very often, have like a whiteboard to draw things. But I want to give you some examples maybe of how people have thought about this. Because I think it's really important to understand the Holy Spirit is not just some sort of like force or impersonal thing, but is part of the Trinity. One way that people have tried to think about uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is that, okay, yeah, thousands and thousands of years ago, there seemed to be this kind of creator God, the Father, right? And then, and then it kind of maybe it transformed into Jesus. So there's like Father, and then all of a sudden there was a, you know, he became Jesus. And then now we have the Holy Spirit. Um, different kind of modes that God went into uh, to say that um, here's how we just saw it. Um, this is what's called a heresy. <laughs> Uh, not to be trusted. It doesn't really show us what is actually true in Scripture. Um, others might say that, well, they're all kind of like partially maybe a part of God, right? There's like the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're all kind of, you know, part of it is God. Part of it is part of the Father is God. No, they're, they're all God, all working together. Or maybe a third thing they might say that's wrong also is that, Okay, well, there's God, and like, well, we'll get split God up into three parts here, and uh, maybe there's actually three different gods, right? Not just one God, but three different gods. Well, let me show you one analogy that I like a lot. Um, all analogies break down in some way, right? But maybe you've heard analogies like um, uh, water, right? Water can be uh, steam or liquid or a solid and ice, kind of three things, one or an egg has a shell, a yolk, and then a terrible name, just the white. What? You need a better name than that. But this is one way that I like looking at the, whole, like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've got one circle. You've got Father. I'll try and draw one. This is a, not a great circle, but you have the Father. You have the Son, also in the same circle. And then you also have the Holy Spirit. So you can kind of see there's three colors there. It's one circle, one essence, one being. This is God, but also three colors, persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, like I said, all these analogies, they, they break down in some way. They're hard. It's, it's a little bit of mystery. But what I'm trying to say in all of this is that the Holy Spirit is God. Not some sort of force or uh, thing that we, we, we just kind of forget about or don't know, but one passage that, that I'll kind of just talk over really briefly here is in Acts chapter 5, um, where, where basically Peter is talking, and in verse 3, he tells somebody, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, and then in verse 4 says, well, you've lied to God, correctly saying, Holy Spirit is God. So, last thing that's probably most important to us, this is all good teaching, it's good things to know, it's kind of good to understand the Bible better, but what, what does the Holy Spirit do for me? What, in my own life, what, what does the Holy Spirit do? So let's go to our, our, our statements again, our statement of faith. Let's read this together one uh, last time reading all together, this is one of our statements of faith. It says this. You can read with me. We believe that the Holy Spirit in all that he does, 
glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt. He regenerates sinners. And in him, they are baptized into union with Christ and adopted as heirs in the family of God. He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. So you see the things I've underlined is that overall, the Holy Spirit's main job is to point to Jesus. Glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And then, kind of breaking it down to three categories of people, he convicts the world in general. He, he does this job to convict everybody. I mean, working with our conscience to convict people. He then has a hand in regenerating sinners to help people come to be a Christian. And then he empowers us, empowers believers in some way. The world, sinners, believers, all of these things. Let's just go to Scripture, too, and see how does Jesus describe the Holy Spirit. This is John chapter 14. Again, this big discourse. He's talking, he's teaching about all of these things uh, to his disciples. And he says, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then verse 26 also, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Again, there's that idea of he points to Jesus. You want somebody in your life to help you know Jesus better, remember Jesus, what he said, what's in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is that one to do that. And he, he dwells, lives inside of us. This crazy idea that even though God is everywhere, there's some sort of special way that he then dwells and lives inside of believers. That should change the way we think about our bodies, our minds, what we think and act and speak and all those things. He's a helper. He gives truth and something different than the world. The world cannot receive him, but we have him dwelling inside. In John chapter 16, then, this verse that we read earlier about, it's to your advantage that I send the Holy Spirit. He goes on in verse 8 and says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And he goes on to talk about, again, being truth and glorifying Jesus. But this idea that the Holy Spirit is there to help guide you and convict and bring you to know Jesus and his righteousness. I'm going to encourage you this, this next week to, to look at Acts chapter 2. I included that in there, but I'll just point you to that, to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the next few weeks here, we're going to get really practical. Really just kind of, this is kind of a big picture theology intro of what, who, why the Holy Spirit. But we're going to look the next few weeks about how does the Holy Spirit help us to understand this um, how does the Holy Spirit help us in salvation? If you have somebody in your life that you want to be saved, <laughs> uh, go to the Holy Spirit. Or if you yourself want to go to heaven and be saved, you need the Holy Spirit. Or all these things we talked about kind of guides, empowers, equips, fills us. We will talk about that with the Holy Spirit. But as a way of kind of concluding, wrapping this up, um, I want to give you kind of three things, kind of application to do this next week. Um, I mentioned Acts chapter 2, but I would encourage you to like look at the book of Acts this next week. Like the first eight chapters. Take a day, read each chapter, uh, and just look for the working of the Holy Spirit. Because 
You could call the book of Acts the Acts of the Holy Spirit. He is all over empowering, encouraging, filling the believers. Uh, number two, I would encourage you to pray through that verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, that says, uh, do not quench the Holy Spirit. And just, just pray and ask God, God, where have I been doing that? Ask him to show you. Ask him to help you to not do that anymore, to not quench the Holy Spirit in your life. And finally, I, I would ask you to pray for our church. Pray for revival. That the Holy Spirit would come here in power and, and bring people in to know God and to point to Jesus in powerful, powerful ways. So, Pray with me now as we uh, close our service with a song and pray for the Holy Spirit. Father, uh, I come to you thankful that you have not left us alone. Father, uh, Jesus, you, you sent the Holy Spirit to draw us to Jesus. And we need that more and more every single day to just be drawn in to know Jesus more, to know his saving work, how good and righteous he is, and God, I feel your conviction on me daily of my sinfulness, but I'm, I'm so thankful for that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I pray for my friends here that if they've never experienced that or had that or known that or feel that they are not even Christians, that God, you would encourage them. You would give them um, an indwelling, a power just to know your spirit in them. And Father, as we come to sing and sing to you, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, with that greater knowledge of who you are, would you fill us and guide us? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.